In this video, we are going to learn about arrays. So arrays in C Sharp allow us to store related data together into one structure. So this could be that we want to store a series of scores together so that we can create a leaderboard, or it could be that we want to store a series of pets together for our virtual pet simulator. I've got a couple examples here from the C Sharp documentation of ways to construct arrays. Like here's an example of creating an array that stores a, a series of numbers together. So this, combined with our looping knowledge that we just learned, will be a significant jump in our programming power. So we'll be able to do much more complex things while writing less code. In this video, we will do some basic practice. We'll, we'll learn how to create a couple arrays. Um, we'll learn these different ways of constructing arrays. Uh, we'll learn how to loop over arrays, and then we'll put this together into a slightly more complex example where we want to store like a team of characters together into an array. So you could think like a, a team of characters in a multiplayer game or like a team of characters in a game like Pokemon. Uh, that'll be the type of thing that we'll try and build towards. And eventually this knowledge of arrays will take us into being able to make a two-dimensional array. Like here's an example of um, a multi-dimensional array here. So we can use this same knowledge to create a 2D map of the world and have a little um, 2D world that the player can explore in our console applications. So that's a teaser for something we'll eventually be able to do. Okay, so motivating this a little bit more concretely, if we think back to the trivia game that we made together in a previous video, we had this application where we created these instances of different trivia questions. And then down here, we copied and pasted this logic for asking each question in sequence. So this was fine for where we were, but this is error prone. Anytime we have to do this copy and pasting, it's tedious and we're likely to make mistakes. So with our loop knowledge and our array knowledge at the end of this video, we'll be able to come back to this, store these questions in an array and loop over them here and display them one at a time. So once we've refactored things, it doesn't matter how many questions there are, there could be 50 questions and we would only need a couple of lines of code to walk through asking each of them in sequence. So I have a basic uh, .NET Core console application created here. I called it Arrays Demo. And if I set up our usual template, I'm gonna bring in the console static class so that I can write line without having to say console.writeLine. And let's say Array Practice. We'll read key and we will write line, press any key to exit. And let's change the title while we're at it. Okay, we got a basic application going that we can start working in and creating some arrays in. So arrays allow us to collect related data together. Let's, let's run with that idea of like a leaderboard of scores. So instead of creating an int for an individual score, we are going to declare that we want an array of integers by adding the brackets to our type of int. And then we can say scores. So we're giving an, a name to this variable. And on the right hand side, let's say it is a new array of integers with room for three integers in it. So now we have a variable here, scores, which has three slots in it for integers. Right now, this doesn't fill in any of those slots. They all take their default value. But if we want to fill in or read any of those scores, we can do something like this scores zero equals 10. So what this is gonna do is go to that first slot in our array and put the number 10 there. And we could do scores one equals 12 to put the number 12 in the second slot in our array or scores two 
to go to the third slot in our array. And if I throw a breakpoint in here and hit play, we can hover over our score and see that it is an array with three slots. Each slot is filled with zero after this runs. If I hit F11 to step over this line and look at my scores, we can see that 10 is now stored in that first slot. And let's do this down here. I'm going to expand scores so we can see uh, 10 is filled into that first slot. I'm going to hit F11. 12 is now put into the second slot. And 11 is put into that last slot. And if we want to print out something like the first score we can use this same bracket syntax to access something from our scores array. Oops, there we go. So we're referring to the identifier for our array, and then in the brackets, we say which element we want. And arrays, we start counting at zero to mean the first slot. So we're saying, here, give us the first score. First score is 10. And I could repeat this process for the second and third score. And we should see all of our scores printing out. 10, 12, 11. So let's whiteboard this out. I'm going to grab this, flip back to our whiteboard, paste it in. And we'll look at what's happening at kind of each line of code here. So this first line of code is creating a new array. And one way that you can think about arrays is that they are these uh, containers with multiple places in them, multiple slots. So when we say int scores equals new int three, that's telling um, the runtime engine to go ahead and create an array with three slots. And because we haven't said what they should be filled with, they'll be filled with the default value for an integer, which happens to be zero, which we saw when we opened up the debugger. So that line of code has created um, the array filled with zeros. This line of code here is going in to our first element, removing what's there, and then putting, whoops, the number 10. And then this next line is coming in here. And let's switch to the eraser and putting in 12. And then that next line is doing the same thing for the third slot and putting in 11. So a couple of pieces of terminology that are good to know. Um, this whole structure here is our array, and then our array is composed of uh, elements. So each thing in here is an element. And the way that we get access to those elements is via an index. So these indices are how we refer to spots in the array, which we were doing here. So we said scores in brackets, we gave it an index, and that allowed us to refer to an element in the array. And our indices here start at 0, not 1, which is what maybe you would expect coming into programming. And if we look at the next three lines of code, we can use our index as well, uh, not just to set what's in the array, but to read what's in the array. A 
couple of important things about arrays before we flip back to the code. Arrays are zero based. So that just means the indexes start at zero by default. The arrays are a fixed type, which means that as soon as we say that this array is an array of integers, that's all we can store in it. We can't throw a string in there. We can't throw a double in there. We can't throw a virtual pet in there. All of those are enforced to be integers. They are also fixed size. So an array, once we create it and we say that there's room for three things here, that's how many slots we have. We can't go ahead and then say, well, let's add a fourth one or let's remove a slot. We are always going to have three slots. If we want room for more, we could create a new array and copy things over to that new array. Um, or, which we'll learn about shortly, we can use lists, which are like arrays, but are not a fixed size. They can be resized. All right, so our arrays are fixed type and fixed size. Let's flip back here. And let's do a few more things. So because arrays are, are a fixed size here, um, and I've said that this is three, if I try and do something like this, I am reaching in and trying to access the fourth slot and put the number 12 there. No compiler error, but as soon as we run it, we're going to get a runtime error that the index was outside of the bounds of the array, meaning that our bounds, uh, we only had room for four thi uh, three things, but we tried to access that fourth slot. Let's create a few more arrays. So even though we said that this array was an integer, that doesn't mean that we can't create arrays that have different types. So we could say we want an array of strings instead of integers, and we'll call this our inventory. And instead of using the um, new syntax up here, we can actually use the initializer syntax to fill in our array as we are creating it. So I could say that the inventory has a potion and a stick and a ring and a shield. And what we've done here is all in one line created an array of four things. So it has room for four things. It's a fixed type, so it's a string type. Um, and it's filled with potion, stick, ring, shield. And you can fill in as many things as you want here. And um, the compiler is smart enough to know uh, how many things there are. It can count this and, and use that when it's constructing the array for you. We could also do something like store a bunch of Booleans if we were getting the player's answer uh, to true false questions. Or we were checking to see whether they got an answer right or wrong. We could have a whole series of true false values. That would be perfectly valid. Whatever type we want, we can use here. And if we were back in our virtual pet simulator, we can create an array of virtual pets. Now, keep in mind, this project doesn't have a class called virtual pet, so this is not going to work. I'm just leaving it here for reference. We will see what this looks like later. But the point is that even though you know your array is a fixed size, you can use any type you want for creating your array. Or uh, not fixed size, I meant to say fixed type. You can use any type you want here. Let's flip back to the browser. Whoops, not that. We want this. So I'll have this page linked in the description. Um, this is the C Sharp programming guide. It shows you a couple of different ways to create lists like we were just doing. You can declare the 
or sorry, the I said lists. <laughs> there are a couple different ways that you can create arrays. Like here, we saw the new syntax. You can also declare an initialize like this or like this. And then there are a couple other types of arrays, multi-dimensional arrays and jagged arrays that we'll, we'll talk about later. And then um, there's more of an overview, explanation, and more guides on the different aspects of arrays. So this is a useful reference to keep handy. What I want to do is talk about loops and arrays. So this is great, creating arrays, but this is tedious. We don't want to have to do anything where we have to reach into each value one at a time. This is where our looping knowledge comes in. So if we look at this code, the only um, kind of difference when we're printing out the scores is this number that we're passing in here. And we also have this number here that's being printed out, um, but that number could be based off of this number. So really, if we had a loop that went from zero to one to two, we could do all of this in one go. And luckily, we learned about for loops, which are really useful when combined with your knowledge of um, arrays. So we can create a variable called i, which we'll use here as short for index. So the index starts at zero, and we want it to go um, till two. So we could hard code this. We could type in the number two here, but there's actually a better way. If we ask for how many things are in the score, like this, we can actually get the number of scores programmatically. So this is going to tell us how many scores are in that array. For scores 10, 12, 11, there are three scores. So dot length is a property that you can access from any array that you create. So down here, when we're creating this loop and we want to go from 0 to 1 to 2, our length is 3. So we can just say, as long as i is less than scores dot length, that will allow us to stop at 2 and never go to 3. And we will add one each time. So let's print out um, scores. And then in here, we can say score i is scores i. So we're just going to print out that loop variable like we've done before when we're doing counting with our loops. But we're also going to use that variable to pull out the score. So the first time this runs, i is going to be 0. It's going to say score 0 is. And then it's going to be the equivalent of what we did up here, where we said score is 0. The benefit of doing it in a loop is that that i value is going to change each time. So we get something that goes through all of the scores. And it doesn't matter how many scores are in the array, this loop will go through all of them. Now, it was a little weird for it to say score 0 is um, 10. So one thing we can do when we're printing this out is just add 1 to i here. So it says score 1 is 10 instead of score 0 is 10. And score 2 is, 10, uh, is 12. So all we did is offset the i that we're printing out here. So we can do the same thing for our inventory. And um, whoops, I want a new line here and here to just space some of these out. So I can create another loop that uses a i variable that goes until inventory.length.
And if we want to clean this up to make it clear what um, inventory I is, we could do something like this. String item is inventory I, and then print out the item in our string here. So we can grab things from our array, store them into variables, and then use those variables later. So same structure for this for loop and this for loop. They are both going to the length. They're going up by one each time. So this should allow us to see all four inventory items printed out. There we go. Whoop. Uh, I forgot uh, what language I was working in and put an extra dollar sign here. So let's get rid of that and let's restart this. There we go, inventory, potion, stick, ring, shield. If we wanted to, we could rewrite either of these loops using while or do while um, to bring our other types of loops into play here. We can also use a fourth loop for each, which will simplify our looping in some cases. So let me show you two examples here. I'm going to do a for each for our scores and one for the inventory. So the syntax here is we have a new keyword um, at the start here to indicate that this is a for each loop. We have a variable that we're creating here that is going to be set with a value from the array we're saying this is going through um, our scores array. So local variable here, and then our array goes here. So if we run it, we can see our for loop here. Score one is 10, score two is 12. And then our for each loop, the score is 10, 12, 11. So they both allow us to move through the loop. The advantage of our for loop is that we have easy access to the index so that we can use it like we're doing here for labeling things. The advantage of for each is that it's quicker to write your loop. This, this is an arguably simpler syntax than our for loop up here. Do so you have either options that you can use? I'm gonna comment out this one and let's do another one. So same structure. We're gonna put the type of the, the elements in our list then let's create a variable to hold each item in sequence. And this goes through our inventory. And we can comment out our for loop and just stick with our for each. which does the same thing, prints out each item in sequence. So it's up to you based on the situation, what kind of loop you need, but you now have one more option um, for looping. With loops, uh, sorry, with arrays, we have access to a few methods that um, exist on arrays and on the array class. So previously, the only thing that we have used is the length property. But if we check out, and I'll have this linked, the array class documentation, this class has properties like our length. Uh, there are a few others here and methods that allow us to perform operations on arrays. So a few that we can see here, there's some search methods. There's a way to clone an array to make a copy. Um, there's a way. Uh, other methods for making copies and moving elements from one array to another. There are methods for finding elements that are within array, looking for the index that corresponds to an element. Um, and then if we keep looking down here, 
there's a method that allows us to reverse an array. If we pop open the docs here, we can see that this reverses the elements in a one-dimensional array, and this is a static method. So that means that we invoke this via the array class, not from one of our array instances. So let's try this. Let's, before we go ahead and print out these scores, let's do array.reverse and pass in our instance, our specific array. So our numbers went 10, 12, 11. They should now go 11, 12, 10. And if we flip back and look through here, there is also a sort method that we can use. So this sorts a one-dimensional array using the iComparable implementation for each element of the array. This basically allows us, um, for some primitive types like numbers and strings, to use the built-in comparison that does a sorting for us in the future, you'll probably want to override this. Like if you wanted to sort your virtual pets, we'd have to do something different. But since we're just dealing with numbers and strings that have a sort that is useful built into C Sharp, we can come down here and before we use our uh, for each to print out our items, we can say array dot sort inventory. So our inventory went potion, stick, ring, shields, we should now see them in alphabetical order. Potion ring, shield stick. So there are more methods to dig into here. For arrays, you'll learn more of them the more that you start to work with arrays and this will be a good reference for you. But we've got a lot of the basics down. We have been able to create arrays and fill those arrays and loop over and access elements from the arrays. So we could go ahead and comment out all of our test code here. So I'm gonna leave the title at the top and leave our write line and read key at the bottom. And what I want to do here is create a party or team system. So instead of just storing numbers or strings, I kind of want to store more into our array. Like maybe uh, because I can't think of names off the top of my head, I'm going to store Pokemon. So I want to store like Pikachu and... Charizard and Bulbasaur. And each of those Pokemon has some information associated with it. So Pikachu, uh, we want it to Pikachu to be yellow, and maybe we want Pikachu to be level 10. And Charizard, we want Charizard to be red and maybe like be level ooh, probably a lot higher, like 40. And Bulbasaur to be green and to be uh, like level 12. We could create three separate arrays. So we could create one that stores the names, one that stores the colors, and one that stores the level. Because each of these is a different type. Remember our arrays are fixed type. So we need a string here, a console color array here, and an int array here. That would be one way to do this. But a better way to do this would be if we created a character class that wrapped up these three pieces of information and we used our array to create an array of characters. So what I wanna do is create a party. Well, let's call it party system class. And let's also create a character class. So our character class is going to be simple. It's just going to store those things that we talked about. Let's store the name. Let's store the 
console color and let's store the level. And we can create a constructor here that goes ahead and sets up our initial values for the name, color, and level. So let's take in jar name. jar color, jar being short for character here, and jar level. So we can set our name equal to our jar name and our color to our jar color and our level to our jar level. And if we were doing this as a um, slower demo, what I would do at each of these points is try to run my application and test that this works. Since we've done this logic multiple times, I'm going to kind of run through this quickly so that we don't waste time. So I'm going to want my character to, at minimum, be able to like display this information. So I'm going to create a public display info method here, and it is going to be a void method, a method that doesn't return anything. And we will go ahead and print out the name. I'm just surrounding it by some characters to add some formatting. And let's print out their level. And you know what, while we're at it, why don't we add, um, let's say it is Pokemon. So we wanna store the type of each Pokemon too. So I'm gonna add that in here, string char type. My type is equal to char type. And that allows us to print out a third thing here. So I'm trying to use right line without the fully qualified path. So I just need to come up here and say that I am using static system dot console to get access to that console class without having to say console dot. And let's also make sure that this prints out in the color that we've specified. So let's store the previous color. We can then set the foreground color to be our color field here. And then when we're done, we'll be kind and we will reset the foreground color to whatever it was before display info started. So with this class in place, I could go back to program and create an instance and tell it to display to see that it's working. And you know what, let's do that. That's important. That's an important step. So I'm just gonna do this in line here. Let's say we are going to create a character called Pikachu, which is equal to a new character. Pikachu, electric type, console color dot yellow, and we said the level is 10. And if I hit play, whoops, I forgot to tell Pikachu to display itself. So we'll use that display info method that we made public so that we could use it here. There we go. So it's printing out, looks good. Um, not Pikachu, made a typo there. But that should be all set. So our character class is working. So what we can do is head over to our party system where I want to store all of the team members of the party and display them. So let's create a constructor and let's also create a run method that will kick off the logic of our party system. For now, this is gonna be really simple. We just want to here display the team and here construct the team. 
But future versions, if you wanted to build on this, like the run could do all sorts of things. You could interact with the characters that are in the team, for instance, here. So I'm going to print out my team, and then I want to display all of the team members. So I'm going to bring Pikachu over. So my when I move into my party system, I want to store these characters um, in an array. So up here, I am going to create a character array. So before we did like int array or string array we can use our own custom types our own classes as the type for the array so we could call this my team set it equal to a new array with three teammates in it and then i can say my team zero is equal to and let's grab the pikachu that we created over here And just so that we can see something working quickly, let's reach into that spot where Pikachu is, the first slot, and display info. So if this party system works, when we construct it and then tell it to run, we should see my team, and then we should see that Pikachu info show up. So back in program, we can get rid of this, and we can create an instance of our party system. So that'll run the constructor, and then my party dot run will call our run method. So our constructor will run, and then run will run. Run will be executed. So there we go. My team, Pikachu showing up. Let's get rid of that array practice. No need for that actually to be there now that I think about it. So with that commented out, we should just have the team Pikachu. So if we go back to our party system, we can just repeat this logic for our other teammates. So into slot two, we are going to put Charizard and slot three, we are going to put Bulbasaur. So let's make that red. And what did we say, like 40? I forget what we wrote here. Yeah, 40 and then 12. Green and 12. So instead of just reaching in and printing out the first teammate, we can use our for each logic for each character, we'll say current character in my team. So same structure, this is the type that matches our array. This is a local variable that will be filled in with each element from our array. And then at the end here, we put the name of our array. And then we can just say current character dot display info. And we no, no, no longer need that line at the end for displaying teammate one. There we go. All three of them are printing out and looks like no bugs. They're all printing out in the right color with the right info. If we wanted, we could space out each of these things by after doing our display, we could just write line an empty line that would help improve this a little bit. There we go. So the nice thing about our arrays here is that if we were to refactor this and change this to be two elements and remove someone and run it again, that's the only change we have to make. Our team logic, our loop still works, 
And we could do the same thing if we said, well, maybe we need to add a fourth team member. We could just go ahead and add a fourth team member here and uh, our loop would still work. The last thing that I'll show you here is just how to use the initializer syntax that we used, like here. So when we created our inventory, we in the curly brackets here, we're able to just throw in our strings. We did it in a kind of a verbose way where we accessed each index one at a time and put in a new character, but we could do something like this, my team equals, and I'm opening up curly brackets and then I'm going to put my constructor here, comma, my constructor here, comma, my constructor here. And then the one thing that I need to add, because um, this syntax doesn't work in quite the same way as it does for our primitives like strings, we just have to say before our curly brackets new character three. So now we don't need this. When this line of code runs, our array is set up to be each of these three characters. So this should be working now. And actually what I would do if we're doing this array initializer syntax is come up here and just say my team without um, creating an empty array. And in our constructor, we'll go ahead and create that array and fill it. So we'll add a, a note, initializer syntax is a little different for custom classes, or I guess for arrays of our custom classes. So there you go, we were able to learn some of the basic syntax of arrays here. Uh, we, we got our mental model when we think about an array, it's a bunch of boxes in memory that are next to one another that we can loop over and perform operations on, which allowed us to, after we got the basic syntax, move up to the stage of putting our own custom classes into those arrays so that we could have like all the Pikachu, the name, the type, the color, the level, all in that one slot in the array. And then in the next slot, we have Charizard, Fire, Red, 40, and then Bulbasaur. So with this knowledge, you should be ready to go back to like your trivia application and try refactoring it so that you have your questions stored in an array and you loop over them um, and display them out one at a time, which means that when you go back and add more trivia items, it's really simple. Your loop will take care of displaying all of them without you having to make any modifications. So that's it for arrays. We will learn in the next video about lists, which are like arrays, except that they can grow and shrink as we need.